In this segment, we're going to talk about reinforcement learning from human feedback, which is one of the uh, sort of bells and whistles that makes ChatGPT and GPT-4 really effective systems. So I'm kind of framing this as an alternative to instruction tuning. Instruction tuning uses labeled data, and RL from human feedback will use human feedback in sort of a different way. Some of the limitations of instruction tuning are that if the data sets that you're tuning on aren't very good, your model won't be able to really go past what you see in your labeled data. And it also is not clear that it's going to enable a model to generalize to new tasks beyond what's in these tuning data sets, right? So we can get all these examples of existing tasks, but is it really going to enable us to do stuff that's not exhibited in any of them? It's a little unclear. So RLHF provides an alternative where what we do is we basically get models to output, you know, give outputs on whatever sort of inputs we want. And then we ask people, which of these is better? The nice thing about this is as long as people can have an opinion, this can kind of work on anything, right? So if we have a super state-of-the-art model, but there's still, we can identify that this response is slightly better than this one, we can still tune it and make it better without relying on data that was kind of originally authored by people. So this kind of sets the stage for this RLHF process. Uh, I'll show the overall uh, kind of diagram here. So the idea is to learn from human comparison of two system outputs, which is very different than the reward in standard reinforcement learning, where you like take some action and then you get some like scalar reward and then that drives your learning. So instead, what we have here on the left, uh, we are basically just seeing uh, the standard either pre-training or fine-tuning pipeline for a model. So that's just sort of what we already know. Then in the middle here, you need to take that existing model you have, let's say base GPT-3, and then you are going to generate a bunch of different outputs, like how to explain the moon landing to a six-year-old, and then have a human rank them. Then these rankings are used to train a reward model that's going to ideally assign scores to these different outputs that reproduce the human ranking. And then that reward model is what you do RL on. Okay, so to go through this a little more formally, we have our quote unquote base language model, which we can think of as like GPT-3. And we're gonna train that in advance and then you know set, set it aside. And then we have our reward model, which we're going to learn, that's going to map these completions Y to real valued scores. Now, the nature of the data used to train the reward model, like I said, is you get two completions for a single input X, and then an annotator says Y1 is better than Y2. Okay, but that only tells you which one is better. It doesn't actually tell you scores for each of them. So then the way that this model is learned is using what's called a Bradley-Terry model, which is a model from preference learning that basically says, we're gonna, take, we're gonna assume there's some underlying scoring function, R, and the probability of a human user saying that Y1 is better than Y2 is gonna be proportional to the exponential of the score for Y1 divided by the sum of the exponentials. So basically standard sort of softmax over the R values. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to derive log probabilities of classification and then maximize likelihood of this preference data while learning an underlying reward function, while learning this R as a way of mapping outputs to real valued scores. Then once we have this R, we can set the human preference data aside and say, now we've got something, we've got a reward model so we can just do reinforcement learning. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna optimize our expected reward over a big data set of prompts. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna sample a prompt X and then we're gonna take the model and say, okay, model, produce the output Y for us. And then given that output Y, we're going to assess the reward and then uh, use a method like PPO, proximal policy optimization, to optimize it. And in this case, we're not just optimizing for the expected reward, but also there's a penalty that kind of forces the model to be close to the base language model. 
So ideally, the model kind of continues to get better and better. It's actually producing better and better responses, but the reward model is still able to say, okay, you know, even though you're making better responses than you were to begin with, I'm still able to judge that this one is better than this one. Whereas instruction tuning, you're just always fine tuning on the data that's provided by the people. So the OpenAI reward models are trained on data that looks very different from instruction tuning as well. Uh, so for example, this brainstorming use case, list five ideas for how to regain enthusiasm for my career. This is about 10% of their data is human judgments about this. And that doesn't look like anything in a supervised standard NLP data set. Uh, and similarly, these, these generation and rewriting examples can be quite a bit different and more diverse than what we see in uh, existing data sets. So this is part of the way that OpenAI can make something like ChatGPT work very well for these sorts of things, even when there's no real collected data for it. So the earliest models that used uh, kind of that, that were sort of GPT-3++ or what what's be, been called GPT-3.5, were actually using something that looks basically like instruction tuning. Um, but what they would do is they would get completions from the model and then whenever a human would rate it with the highest score, um, they would train on that data. Then TextDaVinci 003, which came out shortly before ChatGPT, uh, was actually using RL with PPO. Uh, I think what this indicates is that, you know, given that the idea of RL with human feedback had been around for a while and these earlier versions of the model were not using it, it's a little bit difficult to get working reliably. Uh, and, you know, part of what we see is that uh, it's a little bit hard to know this because the data that OpenAI has is not public and the data that you get from your human annotators is really, really important. Um, it seems like having good quality human written demonstrations and good quality ratings uh, are, is key for this process. So there are a bunch of recent uh, efforts to show that we can actually get models that are as good as ChatGPT without doing RL. Most of these use some kind of supervised fine tuning over outputs that are actually derived from ChatGPT itself. Uh, now, RL may be brittle, although, but it's a little unclear if these other methods really kind of generalize as well as uh, GPT-4 and these other systems. And a lot of them rely on a stronger system to produce the data that you're then going to fine tune on. So uh, the jury is still sort of out on whether we can actually build stronger systems without reinforcement learning or whether that's necessary. That's the end of the segment.